From the air, here is Mount Desert Island, however pronounced by the locals Mount Desert Island. This lobster claw-shaped island is located off the coast of Maine's rocky shore. Located near one of the most populated regions of the planet, America's eastern seaboard, it is a place of spectacular shorelines. a place of forested lowlands, and a place of long, narrow lakes. But it is also the home of Acadia National Park, perhaps the most unique park in the U.S. National Park system. Well, what makes Acadia unique compared to a lot of other parks, particularly the big western parks? It's a relatively small park, acreage-wise, and it's very close to the major population centers on the East Coast, so it's a very accessible park to a lot of people. So it's heavily visited. It's one of the more heavily visited parks in the country. And you combine the visitation with the small size, and that makes it quite unusual. It's also, as you can see here in Bar Harbor, it's interspersed with the surrounding communities. It's a park that's very much enmeshed with dozens of communities that surround it. So you have the wilderness experience, the park experience, then you have the in-town experience, the fishing village experience. It's a, it's a great cultural and, and natural combination. Um, Acadia is just also very rich in terms of the different kinds of values that are here. History, recreation, habitat. Um, you've, got, you've got it all here, and it makes for a very rich experience when you're here. Sonia Berger is the chief interpretive ranger at Acadia. She is deeply familiar with the park's geology, ecology, and history. More than any other park that I've visited, or more than any other park I've worked in, Acadia presents such, such a diversity of um, activities, of things you can do, of things to learn. It really is a sea to summit park where you can go down to the intertidal area and just be amazed at the diversity of life in these small pools under such extreme conditions. You can start hiking through the forest with incredible trails. Uh, the trail history here and the trail construction is something that you can, you can tell that people have poured their heart and soul and sweat and tears into just building these trails, um, which then allow us today to scamper up the sides of the mountains and check out all the sites and then you get up to the top of a mountain you look around and you can see the ocean stretching out in front um, it's just so much packed into such a small place as conservationist George Dorr the father of Acadia National Park wrote in his argument for its very creation save to future generations as it has been to us in the wild primeval beauty of the nature it exhibits. Of ancient rocks and still more ancient sea, with infinite detail of life and landscape interest between. The spirit and mind of man will surely find in it, in the years and centuries to come, an inspiration and a means of growth as essential to them ever and anon as our fresh air and sunshine to the body. From the very first people to live here, the native Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn Land, to the early French explorers, to the men and women who homesteaded the island, to the fishermen who work its coast, to the visitors who experience the park for just a day or a week. For all these people throughout time, Acadia National Park is a mythical place, a place of birth and rebirth. 
and for all those people who have been here, they too become people of the Dawnland. Wabanaki means people of the dawn or Dawnland people. And if for anyone who's ever traveled up Cadillac Mountain to catch the first rays of the sun, to see the sun rise, uh, they're joining in a tradition where people for generation after generation have done so and recognized that Cadillac Mountain, as the tallest mountain on the eastern seaboard, is the first place um, here in Maine in the first place along this eastern coast of the United States to catch those rays. And the fact that the Wabanaki or the Dawnland people have recognized that for thousands and thousands of years is one that just emphasizes that connection of people and place. Indeed, there is great beauty in the magical fog-shrouded dawns at Acadia National Park. The interplay of light, color, and movement across the land, across the resplendent waters, across the lightning sky. The dawns at Acadia stir something deep in the soul. It's more of an intimate park that people experience more personally. Uh, there's great scenic value along the shores, in the mountains, in the quiet forests, or along the lakes that people discover for themselves. It's, it's not just a list of five must-see vistas and places to stop, get out of the car for a second, take a photograph, and move on. People that have lived here their entire lives say that they still haven't found all the beauty that Acadia has to offer. The beauty of Acadia stretches from the sea to the mountaintops. from the smallest detail to panoramic vistas. The landscape of Acadia National Park has inspired painters and poets alike, including Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who wrote many of his poems while living here in the fishing village of Southwest Harbor. O gift of God, O perfect day, whereon shall no man work but play, whereon it is enough for me not to be doing but to be. Through every fiber of my brain, through every nerve, through every vein, I feel the electric thrill, the touch of life that seems almost too much. I hear the wind among the trees playing celestial symphonies. I see the branches downward bent like keys of some great instrument. and over me unrolls on high the splendid scenery of the sky, where through a sapphire sea the sun sails like a golden galleon. O oh, life in love, O oh, happy throng of thoughts whose only speech is song, O oh, heart of man, canst thou not be blithe as the air is and as free? A Day of Sunshine, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Perhaps the best way to experience the natural beauty Acadia National Park has to offer is to travel its famous Loop Road. Known as Rockefeller's $4 million road, it was proposed and constructed in the 1930s to give motorized visitors access to the island's eastern shore. John D. Rockefeller Jr. provided all the money himself for its construction, including many of the spectacular stonework bridges. Stonework bridges that are architectural wonders of beauty in themselves.
The first place along the road is Inland, an area called Sur de Mont. Upon entering the parking lot, off to the right, is a wide nature trail. At first, the trail may not seem like much, but soon a magical world unfolds. The trail splits. One section takes you across a large expanse of wetland. The other is the Hemlock Trail, and after a short distance, it passes under a stand of ancient hemlock trees. Slow-growing and long-lived, the boreal forest's hemlock can reach 80 feet tall or higher. The trees are pyramidal or conical in shape, and their small needles give them a feeling of belonging to some long-ago fairy tale kingdom. From here, you enter onto the major portion of the Loop Road, a two-lane, one-way road. A road that travels along the coast. The Loop Road is beautiful in and of itself, but again, it just gives people access to the shore. And in Maine, that's fairly unusual. Most of the Maine coastline is privately owned. Uh, despite conservation efforts, most of the land is technically off limits to folks to get down to the shore. So to be in Acadia National Park with miles and miles of spectacular coastline that's open to the public is, is, is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Any place is a good place to stop and enjoy the ocean views. However, a must stop is Sand Beach. Here, a short walk takes you to an open beach expanse. With dramatic rock ledges rising above each side, it is one of the few sand beaches not closed to the public along the main coast. This beautiful site was used in the film Cider House Rules. Sand Beach is a place where the dynamics of where the ocean meets the land is something that every time you go there it changes. Any time of year, the time of day, it changes with the tides, it changes with the seasons. And it's just a beautiful place to sit and relax or to watch the power of nature just uh, in action on a human time scale. The next stop along the Loop Road is Otter Point, one of the most breathtaking spots on the island, perhaps the state, the country, or the world. In front of you is the ocean in all its glory. On one side, Otter Cliffs. Just experience the awe-inspiring surf crashing against the huge boulders. Then climb down to one of the many tide pools in the park. Tide pools have their own beauty. Rocks draped in seaweed. Seaweed sometimes gently flowing with the currents. reflecting pools. And of course, a unique intertidal ecosystem full of life. The intertidal area, um, an interesting fact about Acadia is that the official park boundary actually ends at the low tide line. And that varies anywhere between eight to 12 feet between high tide and low tide. So if you go and explore the shore at high tide, you're only seeing a glimpse of what's there. And some of the most fascinating creatures in Acadia exist between the high tide and low tide area. They need to survive not only being in the water and being at the water's edge and the shoreline's edge where there are crashing waves, but they also need to be able to survive being dried out, being, um, they need to survive being completely submerged to being completely exposed. They're exposed to predators both by the air and in the water. Um, the gulls at low tide just see the intertidal area as a seafood buffet and then other predators such as the crabs or other fish will come in when it's high tide. The intertidal area, the, the creatures that live there look very fragile and they are. Um, but they have to withstand some of the most extreme conditions that you'll find anywhere in the park. 
Nowhere is the difference between high tide and low tide more dramatic than the area between the small town of Bar Harbor and Bar Island to the north. At low tide, the visitor can walk or drive their car to the island. At high tide, that same land looks like this. Back on the Loop Road, it swings away from the ocean and heads back in a northerly direction. On the right is Wildwood Stables. Here's where visitors can board a horse and buggy for a carriage ride along the network of carriage roads. It's the ultimate Acadia experience. Carriage roads were built uh, early in the 20th century uh, by John D. Rockefeller um, as a way, at that point, for equestrians uh, to enjoy the park in a non-motorized fashion. They wind their way, they're beautifully landscaped and laid out, esteemed landscape architects helped with the design and the, and the layout of them. And so they are gravel roads that have no vehicles on them. They have bikes, horses, and walkers and joggers in the winter. It's fantastic for cross-country skiing. So again, it's a more accessible way to experience the park than a more remote or rugged hiking trail. They're gradually graded, so it's very user-friendly, very historic, and just takes you into the heart of the park. There's about 45, 50 miles of these carriage roads in the park. Before Jordan Pond, the Loop Road once again becomes a two-way highway. Jordan Pond is actually one of the many glacier-carved lakes in the park. Long and narrow, a very pleasant trail circumnavigates the lake and provides an opportunity for breathtaking views of the mountain landscape that surrounds Jordan Pond. But this is a must-stop for another reason. Another favorite place of mine would be the Jordan Pond House. It's the only restaurant in the park. And as a geologist, I like to sit back and gaze out at the beautifully glacially sculpted landscape. Uh, you have north and south bubble, rounded top mountains, a U-shaped valley, a glacial moraine. So there's a lot of really, um, really interesting things to look at. But being at the only restaurant in the park that has a history of serving popovers, you can top that all off with a popover sundae, which is just a great way to end your day. Or a popover and coffee may be just what you need to push forward. Push forward to a hike. The next stop along the Loop Road, a hike up to Bubble Rock one of the most spectacular glacial features in the park. A relatively steep but well-maintained trail leads through the mixed boreal and eastern deciduous forest. Climbing the 700 vertical feet of South Bubble sometimes takes you over rough boulder terrain. When you finally break out into the open, Spectacular views reward you for all your efforts. But what you've come to see is one of the wonders of the park, Bubble Rock itself. It's a um, glacial erratic, which just means that it's a glacially transported object that um, all across the forest floor, all across the mountaintops, you find these rocks that have been scattered erratically by the glacier as, as it was melting. So some of them are as large as cars. Um, and some of them are really tiny. So the ones that get a lot, of, um, a lot of publicity are the ones that look completely out of place, like Bubble Rock on South Bubble Mountain. The granite that it is comprised of has huge crystals that look completely different. Instead of the smaller pink crystals of Feldspar um, in the Cadillac Mountain granite, which is what the, the uh, glacier, glacial erratic is sitting on, you have these really giant thumb-sized crystals, white feldspar instead. So it's very obviously something different that came from someplace else. The last stop along the Loop Road is a drive up to Cadillac Mountain, the signature feature of Acadia National Park. At 1,530 feet, Cadillac Mountain is not only the tallest mountain in the park, 
but also the tallest mountain along the eastern coast of the United States and into Mexico. The winding and scenic road that ascends to the top of Cadillac Mountain is approximately 3.5 miles long. Officially opened in 1931, the road takes you through Acadia's terrestrial ecosystems. First encountered are the trees of the eastern deciduous forest, aspen, oak, birch, beech, and maple. Climbing higher, one passes through forests of spruce and pitch pine. Near the top, one breaks through into the subalpine meadows. It is dominated by low-lying scrub bushes and plants like Labrador tea, sheep laurel, bilberry, sumac, and low bush blueberry. There are several small observation points along the way that offer prime viewing opportunities of the surrounding park landscape and the ocean with its many islands. Cadillac Mountain is largely composed of pink granite, granite that is periodically seen in road cuts along the drive up. But it is the beautiful, magical world at the top of the mountain that everyone must experience. It is a world of stunted trees, lichen-covered boulders. And it is a world of spectacular views, views that give a 360 panorama of the most magnificent surroundings on the East Coast. Compared to the sweeping vistas of Acadia, its flowers have a more subtle beauty. Springtime brings a sea of white, white trilliums, and white flowering shrubs and bushes. In June, spring gives way to the many flowering wild roses Acadia is known for. With the arrival of fall, the pink rose flowers have turned into plump red rose hips. They are joined by the yellow golden rods. And of course, the many shades of purple of the New England asters. But Acadia is best known for the dazzling visual delights of its fall color, perhaps the best fall color in the entire world. I grew up in Minnesota and we had, you know, I thought we had fall, we had plenty of colors changing. Um, and when I came out here to New England, I finally, um, I finally realized what everybody was talking about. Um, the intensity of the reds and the maples and the oranges and the yellows and the combination of all of those colors are really spectacular when the conditions are right. Um, peak season can vary any time between late September to mid to late October, depending on the weather. With the arrival of fall, everywhere you look, the transformation from the dark greens of summer to the fiery reds, rich oranges, and brilliant yellows dazzle the visitor. Locals have a curious name for the tens of thousands of folks that come to experience the fall color, leaf peepers. The color change occurs earliest in the subalpine meadows. The low-lying ferns turn radiant golds and yellows. 
Next to change are the birch and aspen stands. These slender white bark trees are transformed into their own hues of yellow, gold, orange, often against the background of dark green conifers. One place to look for unusual fall color is Acadia's acidic bogs. The low-lying sphagnum mosses and shrubs glow a subtle orange. The tamarack trees blaze a bright yellow. And if the conditions are just right, the brilliant white seed heads of the cotton grass dance in the gentle breezes of Acadia. Interestingly, cotton grass is not a grass, but a sedge. Next to change are the stands of beech trees afire with intense yellows. However, what one really wants to see are the maple trees' many shades of red. Each perspective is unique. The distant view provides an impressionistic collage of color. Each new stand of maples lining the roadway seems to be better than the last. Look up and see the backlit leaves against the wispy clouds in deep blue skies. Then there are the lakes, reflecting back the color from above. Up close and personal, each individual leaf reveals its own shape and shade of red. As the maple trees fade, the mighty oaks spring to life with their denser hues of red-orange and purple. Sometimes, if you're lucky, all the trees, including the dark greens of the pine, come together in great stands of color. The last place to look is at your feet. As the tree canopy diminishes, the leaf litter becomes a painter's palette with its own mosaic of colors. Each day, each year is different, never to occur again. Such is the beauty of Acadia, a beauty based on its ecology and geology. Mount Desert Island is the largest island off the coast of Maine. With an area of 108 square miles, 
It is the sixth largest island in the contiguous United States. The story of the bedrock of Mount Desert Island covers only a small part of the history of the Earth. Indeed, the earliest geologic history recorded in the rocks of the park dates back 550 million years, when the area was part of an ancient sea bottom. The oldest rocks are the Ellsworth Schist, which began as sediments 500 to 600 million years ago, and they were metamorphosed under intense heat and pressure. Then there is a layer of sedimentary rock called the Bar Harbor Formation, maybe about 460 million years. Into these older rocks came intrusions of granite, which would form deep within the earth. And that's the Mount Desert granite. The, uh, the Cadillac Mountain granite is the primary rock that you see here, the really beautiful pinks. If you look close enough, you can see individual mineral crystals of pink feldspar, uh, black hornblende, and a white or clear quartz. All these interlocking minerals are really strong and resistant to erosion. And that's why we have Mount Desert Island and the spectacular topography that we have. It was able to withstand millions of years of erosion where the other softer sediments weren't able to. So the igneous rock, the uh, Cadillac Mountain granite, um, really starts to form the foundation for a lot of the biological stories, the cultural stories that we have here in the park. It took geologists some time to figure out why these granites show up here on Mount Desert Island. It required understanding that throughout the geologic history of the planet, the continents moved across the globe, sometimes colliding with each other and then pulling apart. These are processes still at work today, including the formation of the Cascade Mountain volcanoes in the western part of the United States. One of the reasons why there was such the, of an intrusion of granite into this area was because where we are now was on a smaller plate that was being squished between two larger plates as Pangaea was being formed. A lot of people are familiar with Pangaea supercontinent and it started forming and a smaller, um, a smaller tectonic plate called Avalonia was kind of squished between North America and the African Eurasian plate um, because of that interaction, we had more magma coming up and intruding into the older rocks, leaving behind the granite that we have today. Spotting the ancient granites on the island is not difficult. The namesake granite, the Cadillac granite, can be found um, Cadillac Mountain. And if you hike any way, any direction down from Cadillac Mountain, the rock underneath your feet for several miles um, in any direction will be that same Cadillac Mountain granite that stretches um, over to the west side of the island along the eastern shoreline down towards the coast. Um, and it's not until you get to the Ocean Drive and you start seeing where the cliffs stop and the sea begins that um, you find the edge of that magma chamber. If you want to see the sedimentary rocks on the island, Bar Harbor Formation. A lot of times geologists are not very creative with their names. Um, if you go to Bar Harbor, you can find nice sedimentary layers, horizontal bedding planes of sands and gravels, even a little bit of volcanic ash, which hints towards some of that volcanic activity which shows up in the granites um, that you'd find in Bar Harbor. Eons of time passed before the next significant geological event shaping Mount Desert Island arrived. Massive continental glaciers, Several hundred million years go by, and the rocks that were laid down during those different environments and intruded with the granites um, start to be exposed to the elements. Um, several hundred million years of erosion. And then, only the last couple million years, will you have the action of the glaciers coming through to get that final polish. Um, but it's an undeniable presence of glaciers that you can see here at the park with rounded mountaintops, U-shaped valleys gouged out by, uh, by that glacial movement through old stream valleys, which would show V-shapes, now become U-shapes. Um, you can also find telltale signs like striations or polish on some of the rock surfaces. And then bigger examples, um, such as moraines, big piles of debris that were left at the edges of glaciers as they melted back. Of course, found throughout the park are many glacial erratics, rocks brought here by the glaciers from distant areas. 
rocks including the famous bubble rock seen earlier. Finally, there are a number of glacial carved lakes on the island. Sometimes called ponds, they include Seal Cove Pond, Hodgton Pond, Long Pond, Echo Lake, Jordan Pond, Eagle Lake, and one very special water and geological feature, Somes Sound. So there are a lot of glacial features on this landscape. Glacially sculpted valleys that are filled with seawater are called fjords. It's a Norwegian term. And if you go to Norway, you'll see these gorgeous thousand foot plunging cliffs that go into the water. Um, and there is a feature here at Acadia National Park that to early geologists reminded them of those fjords. It's a place called Somme Sound, and it separates the east side of Mount Desert Island from the west side. Uh, with a little bit more glacial scraping, it very easily could have carved um, Mount Desert Island into two separate islands. But there's enough uh, landmass to the north of Somme Sound that instead it makes Mount Desert Island look like, I think it looks like a lobster claw almost. It makes those two different lobes. So it's a flooded glacial valley, flooded with seawater. So it does um, have fjord-like aspects, but unfortunately, um, Current research does not support that fjord definition. It doesn't have walls that are quite steep enough. Um, the, the water in there is not quite deep enough. It actually is mixed better than a true fjord. So the actual technical definition, this is a true geologic term, is a fjord. Finally, a prominent geological landmark on the island is the granite quarries in the Somesville area, particularly the historic Hall Quarry. Granite quarrying began here in the early 1870s. It required the brute strength of both men and oxen. Teamsters with their oxen or horses were paid $1.50 a day. Quarrymen, consisting mostly of Italians, Swedes, Finns, and Scots, were paid $2 for a 10-hour workday. The quarry produced prize granites for the construction of major buildings up and down the eastern seaboard. Prized granites that can be seen today in many of the historic bridges found in Acadia National Park. The quarry ceased operation in 1965. Here is a map that shows the bedrock geology of the island. Note the dominance of the granites. Note the location of the hall quarry. And finally, note the small area of sedimentary rocks near the tourist town of Bar Harbor. Here is where bedrock is exposed. Exposed mainly in areas of higher elevation. It is the topography of Acadia National Park that is a major factor in the location of its ecosystems. Acadia National Park is blanketed with forests and woodlands that are situated in the transition zone of two ecoregions, the Northern Boreal Forest and the Eastern Deciduous Forest. Much of the park is covered by black and white spruce, balsam fir, a smattering of hemlock, and of course the majestic white pine. White pine is the state tree and the state flower of Maine. And the white pines, the tall straight white pines um, with really beautiful branches coming out are one of those unique trees that you can see around here. All of these evergreens are representatives of the boreal ecosystem. However, Acadia also contains stands of oak, maple, beech, and other hardwoods more typical of the eastern deciduous forest that dominates most of New England. 
Interestingly, a catastrophic fire in 1947 burned a large portion of the eastern side of Mount Desert Island and rearranged the basic distribution of ecosystems in the park. One event that has really helped increase the biodiversity here is the fire of 1947. There were tremendously wet spring, which helped increase fuel load, and then a very, very dry summer all, the, all across the state of Maine. Uh, resulted in some tinderbox conditions um, where a spark at a town dump, that's the, that's the story <laughs> of how it started, uh, was thought to have been put out in the fall of 1947, but then it was quickly realized that that fire had gone and winds spread the fire. Um, it ended up burning thousands and thousands of acres, um, tens of thousands of acres in the park and around in the surrounding community. In its most immediate wake, it looked just like a devastating um, place where everything had been killed. But in reality, it created the conditions for a lot of new growth um, that was great for a lot of the trees that we see today, which are ablaze with fall colors, the maples, the oaks, um, the birches, the beech. Those trees wouldn't have been able to grow had it not been for that event that kind of burnt away some of the darker spruce fir forests and allowed for that new growth to happen. There are also several unique isolated forest communities, such as scrub oak and pitch pine woodlands. Pitch pine is a shorter needle pine, where unlike most kinds, the needles come out in bunches of three, rather than the twos of the red pine and the fives of the white pine, also found throughout the park. Stands of jack pine reach the southern limit of their range in Acadia. In addition to the forest, Acadia has representative communities of marshes, bogs, and riparian ecosystems. Because Mount Desert Island is isolated from the mainland, and because of the abundance of small communities and summer homes, Acadia is not a place for viewing large mammals, except perhaps the white-tailed deer. Lots of white-tailed deer will be seen through the forest. It's probably the largest mammal that people have a good chance of seeing. However, we have just recently had sightings of black bear and of moose on the island. We know that they're here, we see their sign, um, but because it's the interface between the park and the community is such that um, there's not a big buffer in a lot of areas, you don't see the large mammals like the moose or, or the bear very often. So when we do see those, uh, those sightings, it's a really exciting time for both the visitors and for the park staff too. However, one mammal every visitor is likely to see is the eastern gray squirrel. Members of the rodent family, they spend most of their lives in trees, but they are also well adapted to yards, gardens, and city parks. Basically, they live anywhere there are large deciduous trees. They can grow up to 20 inches long. They have grayish brown fur with a large bushy tail. Another member of the rodent family, one that the typical visitor is not likely to see, is the beaver. A very important species here in the park would be the beaver because it helps transform areas that would be streams into ponds, it completely transforms the, um, the valley floors um, as those ponds then increase sediment and change the ecosystems around them, other trees die out, new trees and new vegetation grow around the edges, and places where those beaver dams then are breached become new sedimented areas that can support new grass growth, so there's a constant change. It's a very dynamic environment, and the beaver changing its environment to suit its needs is something that holds a lot of, um, a lot of people's imagination and is one of the wildlife sightings that people like to glimpse while they're here. There's a lot of evidence of beavers who are quite busy um, around the Jordan Pond area, around Eagle Lake, um, going over into the Nature Center area, Sertamont Springs. You can look for chews on the trees, uh, you can look for the dams and the lodges, and maybe if you're lucky catch a glimpse of one of those beavers swimming around too hard at work. 
Beaver are not the only members of the island that helped shape the park. The park also has a long and interesting human history to tell about its creation. Today, Acadia National Park comprises 73 square miles along the coast of Maine, an area spread out over a large portion of Mount Desert Island, much of the Isle of Haute, and a portion of the Skudik Peninsula. Prior to European exploration, the area was occupied by the Algonquin-speaking Wabanaki people. It is said that Samuel de Champlain, the father of French colonization of North America, was the first to explore the region and gave Mount Desert Island its name. When you take a look at the map, um, Mount Desert Island or Mount Desert Island, it's spelled like desert. But if you come to Maine, you don't have to spend too long here to know it's not hot and dry like a desert. However, a lot of the mountaintops are kind of barren at the summit. Um, and in 1604, when Samuel Champlain was sailing into this area and making records in his journal about what he saw, he saw a series of seven to eight mountains um, that from the sea, he could tell, had barren rocky mountaintops. So he called it La Ile des Mont Desert, or the island of barren or deserted mountains. A uh, little nod towards the French pronunciation has many people here today call it Mount Desert Island, even though you can also call it Mount Desert Island. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that the island became of interest to English colonists. In 1760, the governor of Massachusetts Colony offered free land on Mount Desert Island to settlers Abraham Soames and James Richardson. They established their families at what is now Soamesville. Then in 1820, when Maine separated from Massachusetts to become an independent state, the island began to thrive as farming and lumbering vied with fishing and shipbuilding as major local industries. Settlers converted hundreds of acres of trees into wood products ranging from schooners and barns to baby cribs and hand tools. Farmers harvested wheat, rye, corn, and potatoes. By 1850, the familiar sights of fishermen and sailors, fish racks and shipyards, revealed a way of life that would dominate the region to the present. Then with the arrival of the Gilded Age in the 1890s, the pulse of the island changed again as it became a summer destination for the robber barons the Rockefellers, Morgans, Fords, Vanderbilts, Carnegies, and Astors chose to spend their summers here. Not content with simple lodgings, they transformed the landscape of Mount Desert Island by building huge, elegant estates, ironically called cottages. At the same time, through such men as John Muir and Gifford Pinchot, conservation and preservation of unique natural features was becoming part of the American psyche. This is one of the few parks that was established entirely through donations of land. And so what the people did here a hundred years ago through gifts of land, what they did in terms of building trails, it's very inspirational and I think it makes people think about conservation and the act of conservation as well as the beauty of the landscape they're in. In fact, not only was the Acadia National Park land acquired through gifts and purchases by the wealthy, but much of its access for the public was also funded by men such as George Dorr, and in particular, John D. Rockefeller Jr., whose money helped build the Loop Road and many of the carriage roads. That private stewardship of the land continues today through an organization called Friends of Acadia. Dave McDonald is its president. Friends of Acadia was founded 26 years ago by volunteer citizens here in the community who felt that while the park was doing an excellent job 
they would benefit from a more involved volunteer workforce and involved citizenry to help accomplish the mission. So the mission of Friends of Acadia is to work closely with the park to preserve and protect and promote the stewardship of the scenic resources, the wildlife habitat, the rich cultural resources for the enjoyment of present and future generations. As a result of this continued conservation philanthropy, new lands for the park are constantly being added, such as the addition of 39 acres in 2012 of undeveloped land along Lower Hadlock Pond near the village of Northeast Harbor. There is a great diversity of ways to experience Acadia. I think that Acadia offers a wonderful uh, selection of different hikes, of different experiences, the ability to head out the door and decide, do I want to kayak on a pond? Do I want to climb to the top of a mountain? We're fortunate here, most of the mountains are open and treeless on top, so you get the views very quickly. It's not just a tunnel in the trees, which are the hiking experience a lot of other places. And even though two and a half million people visit the park a year, uh, you can find places even at the busiest time of year that you feel like you have the whole place to yourself. Acadia is a park where you can get very close to nature and feel like you are a part of the landscape, that you belong in the landscape. Uh, whether it's the, the trails that are very well taken care of, the, there's, there's a human element to the beauty here and an acknowledgement that people are part of the landscape instead of just be standing in awe of it and feeling insignificant. And I think that's one of the things that I like about it the best. Indeed, the human aspect of Mount Desert Island is part of the Acadia experience. It starts with Bar Harbor, the gateway to the park, and the focal point of the tourist industry. Here is where the thousands of visitors arrive from the cruise ships that stop daily in Frenchman Bay during the high season. Bar Harbor is a bustling village of fine seafood restaurants and tourist shops. It is also a place of stately mansions erected by the rich and famous of the 19th century's Gilded Age. But there are also quaint fishing villages on the island, villages frozen in time such as Northeast Harbor and Southwest Harbor. And of course, the lobster industry is alive and well on the island and available for part of your Acadia experience. However, the most vital and invigorating way to experience the park is to travel on one of its many well-maintained trails. Earl Brecklin has written the definitive book on hiking Acadia. The Bar Harbor Shore Path is the most accessible hiking trail on the island. Acadia National Park, Mount Desert Island and Bar Harbor have more than 150 miles of hiking trails and paths, as well as carriage roads that can be used to access the outdoors. Today we're along the shore path here in Bar Harbor, which is about a mile and a half long. It's unique in that it's on private property that's been open to the public for more than 100 years. The first thing we're going to look at is the Bar Harbor breakwater as we walk along the shore path. It was built in 1909 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's over 100 feet wide at the base and rises 70 feet from the floor of the ocean. It was never completed with the capstones put on it, but it still provides a valuable barrier to protect the fishing fleet and tour boats that are in the harbor. Balance Rock here along the shore path is a glacial erratic, which was dropped by a glacier in the spot pretty much where you see it now. Although old postcards from around 1900 show that it stood in a different position and has since been knocked on its side by wind and waves. Uh, Bar Harbor is also a uh, port of call for more than 110 cruise ships each year, which bring passengers from all over the world and who tour Acadia National Park and shop in downtown Bar Harbor. Uh, the beaches here are often rocky rather than sandy and are composed of what are called cobbles, which are round stones that have been smoothed by the action of wind and waves as well. Uh, years ago, many of these stones were collected by schooner captains for ballast and then sold in cities to the south, such as Portland and Boston, for use 
uh, as paving stones on the streets. The Bar Harbor Shore Path is one of the few trails where the adventurers can leave the path during low tide and investigate the tidal pools along the island's rocky shoreline. All along the shore path, tide pools await exploration and discovery. You have to be careful on the rocks, especially when they're wet. The moss and the seaweed can be very, very slippery. The tide here changes as much as 12 feet twice a day. But as the water recedes, it exposes pools with sea creatures and anemones, shells, snails, sometimes crab, starfish that you can uh, find and check and, and, and carefully put back after you're done. It's especially a great spot for kids. We're now standing in front of the Breakwater Estate, a privately owned home here along the shore path. It's one of many that were built by the millionaires that turned Bar Harbor's golden age in the late 1800s. The town was first discovered back in around 1850, 1860 by painters from the Hudson River School, including Frederick Church and Thomas Cole. Their paintings inspired scores of visitors who came to Bar Harbor by train, taking the train to a point not far away across the bay, and then taking a steamboat for the final journey to Bar Harbor. The town's tradition of philanthropy continues today when many of the wealthy summer residents support area institutions and organizations. The islands visible along the shore path in Frenchman's Bay are known as the porcupines, not because that's where porcupines live, but because of their distinctive shape, their rounded edges and the fir trees on top, which especially from the top of Cadillac Mountain in Acadia National Park, look like that mammal. One of the more interesting islands is called bald porcupine, which was used as torpedo practice by the U.S. Navy in World War II and actually has caves on it underwater that were created by the explosions. Another one is Rum Key, which was supposedly used, according to local legend, by smugglers during Prohibition to bring liquor into town to the reading room, which was chartered as a club, but was actually a front for summer folks to be able to enjoy their liquor in peace. Now we're going to go to another spot, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the do's and don'ts of hiking in Acadia and in Bar Harbor. Acadia has over 150 miles of trails. They range from very easy, such as the shore path, which can be done with casual shoes on a short notice, to very challenging hiking trails that require proper footwear, such as hiking boots, and some that include iron rungs that are pounded into the face of sheer cliffs that require climbing skills, and you need to be very careful when you do those. Uh, whenever hiking in Acadia, it's good to take a map. It's good to bring a jacket because the weather can change very rapidly. It can get windy or rain can come up almost without notice and the fog can move in. It's uh, also good to carry some water because not all streams run all times of the year and you want to be careful about that. In addition to hiking Acadia's network of trails, another popular way of experiencing the park is biking. And of course, a horse-drawn carriage ride awaits the romantic visitor. Another way to experience Acadia is to get off the island. Each day during high tourist season, small tour boats led by park interpretive rangers depart from various locations on the island. Our trip today is to Little Cranberry Island. Located south of Mount Desert Island, it is a small lobster harvesting community of a few hundred people. We boarded our boat from Northeast Harbor. It is a cold, rainy, and windy day, but the boat is packed. Our guide was Eleanor Hodak, a marine biologist. And the second is that I love to talk about water. Um, so you're probably on the only boat cruise out to Little Cranberry that ends up talking about plankton, but you are going to learn to love it by the end of this trip. But I love to talk about water because of my background, but also because this is Maine, right? The Gulf of Maine out here influences absolutely everything. The very first people that came out here did not settle on Mount Desert Island. They were out here because the water was their highway, was their livelihood, right? Was their recreation. It all is the water. And so this trip today really shows you this enduring connection to the sea that people have. And we are going to experience it in a lot 
a lot of different ways. The first thing we encounter is the Bear Island Lighthouse. 1,200 feet from the shoreline, it is located at the southern entrance to Somes Sound. It is typical of a main lighthouse. You don't need a huge, huge lighthouse when you've already got a big island with rocky cliffs and you can just put that smaller lighthouse right up there on the top. So the Bear Island Light was built in 1839 and it was rebuilt later in the 1850s and for a long period of time it fell into a big state of disrepair and nobody was looking for it, no one was looking after it and it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, and finally, the Friends of Acadia, a nonprofit group that works very closely with the park, bought it up, fixed it up, and then gave it back over to us. Heading towards Little Cranberry Island, we encounter many small islands covered by the typical boreal spruce fir forest. Luckily, it's low tide. Right now, we are looking at Sutton Island, and you are seeing Sutton Island close to low tide. So I've got my tide chart out now. Today's Wednesday the 26th. Low tide today is 2.37 p.m. So in an hour and 20 minutes, we will see as much land exposed today as we ever will for today. And then slowly, six hour period, all of those rock weeds will be covered back up again, all of those barnacles, all the way up to that black line, which is an algae, and marks the splash zone. And really for us, it's a perfect indicator of where high tide is. So there's two things that are really, really super unique about the water out here. The first is that we have a huge tidal range. So how many of you guys are from places in coastal communities? Okay, well, he, he lives here, he doesn't count. <laughs> All right, in other parts of the country, uh, your tidal range can be mere inches, sometimes a few feet. So eight to 12 is a huge, huge difference. There is another way the coastal main waters are unique is that it is very, very cold. This water is not coming up the Gulf Stream from Florida, the Caribbean, the Bahamas. Oh no, this is coming down the Labrador Current from the Arctic Ocean. Glaciers, icebergs, now it's here in the Gulf of Maine. We used to say that it didn't give, get above 48 degrees out here. This year we've seen it at 52, 54, and at some parts 57 degrees, right? So what's going on? Is this going to be a, a, you know, something that we see again and again, or is this just a sort of fluke? We have to watch and learn, but there are things that could be happening that are causing this water to be a little bit warmer, right? And what that means for the lobstermen, uh, we'll see. At last, our destination is in sight. Little Cranberry Island and its scenic harbor town of Islesford, Maine. A mere 200 acres, Little Cranberry Island is an island off the chilly coast of Maine. And about 100 people are crazy enough to live here year round. All around us, as we pull into the harbor, are lobster boats. We dock next to the lobster co-op. Inside, we take a look at the catch of the day. Maine lobster and crabs. This tiny refuge in the sea is home to 15 or so lobstering families and assorted artisans. For an hour, we wandered around, taking in the local culture and scenery. Interestingly, only one acre of land on the island is part of Acadia National Park. Back on the boat, Eleanor brings our attention to the lobster industry. The cold, clean waters of Maine's rocky coast provide an ideal habitat for lobster. The patience and fortitude it takes to harvest lobster successfully has been woven into the fabric of Maine's culture. Each lobsterman has a boat and a number of lobster traps marked by colorful buoys. Buoys we have been seeing all around us on our trip. The colors are not merely decorative. Each color pattern corresponds to a similar marker on top of each lobster boat, clearly delineating who owns a particular lobster trap. After overfishing destroyed the cod industry, Maine and its lobstermen 
went down a careful path of regulation and self-regulation to ensure that the over 70 million pounds of lobster taken every year continue as a sustainable food resource. Every lobsterman will have a gauge like this, right? And what they're doing is they're measuring the size of the carapace. So not the whole lobster, just the carapace up here, which is from the back of the eye to the start of the tail. You guys are sitting. See how well I'm doing standing? Um, and so they'll hold that up. And if they're less than three and a quarter inches, they're too small. They're shorties, they're snappers. They're not yet reproducing. If they're brought up to a boat, they'll look at it and then they'll throw it back overboard. It gets to live another watery day. Now, Maine especially knows how important lobster is to our economy, to the livelihood of people on these outer islands, that they wanted to take care of their stock much better than they did with the cod. And so they pioneered what's called the maximum size rule, which is if that cod is bigger than five inches, which is pretty much the length of this gauge, it's too big, right? Those are the big moms, the big dads, putting out a lot of sperm, a lot of eggs, making a lot of little baby lobsters. Right? We want them in the water, we want them reproducing, we want them adding to the brood stock, so they go back over. Every lobsterman is constantly watching to make sure the rules are followed. Lastly, we make a brief cruise to Somme Sound, the almost fjord. The walls are steep, but not steep enough. Along the way, we get a quick glimpse of an osprey on its nest but the weather is turning sour, and we head back to Northeast Harbor. Thank you guys so much for coming out here. If anybody needs maps of the park or tide charts, let me know. It's been a pleasure. This has been really fun. You guys are way more fun than my morning cruise, just to let you know. And uh, it's been a pleasure, so thanks, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There is one last way to experience the park, by air. The plane takes off from Trenton, Maine, located on the mainland just north of Mount Desert Island. The first sight to see is Thompson Island, a small patch of land in between the mainland and Mount Desert Island. In front of us, the beauty of the whole park is revealed. We see many of the park's landmark lakes and mountains. From right to left, Long Pond, Echo Lake, Somm Sound, Sargent Mountain, Jordan Pond, Eagle Lake, and the mountain with the famous winding road, Cadillac Mountain. As we head southeast, we begin our clockwise loop around Mount Desert Island. The historic town of Bar Harbor appears below. The sandbar that leads to Bar Island. As the plane heads south, the rocky coastline of the island's rugged west coast and Acadia National Park's Loop Road come into view. Closest to us is Champlain Mountain. The bare tops of Door and Cadillac Mountain can be seen across the narrow valley. We're now rounding Great Head in the southeast corner of the island, and suddenly Sand Beach emerges. Just offshore is Old Soaker Island. Further down the coast, Thunder Hole can be seen. This naturally carved narrow inlet endures huge splashing waves as the tide rises. Just a couple of miles along the shore is the breathtaking Otter Point and Otter Cove. From the air, one can see that the whole of Otter Point resembles an otter's flipper. At this point, the airplane heads offshore and we get a different look at the Cranberry Islands. One last look at all three of these heavily forested islands. As we head back to shore, Acadia's eastern mountains, including Cadillac and Door Mountain, again come into view. Their tops, rounded by glaciers ages ago, 
are truly stunning. Below is the small town of Northeast Harbor, established on the east side of Somme Sound. The next stop is Southwest Harbor, located across the Sound. Nearby is Bass Harbor. And here is Bass Harbor Head Lighthouse, a historic landmark on the island. Now the plane is following the southwest coast of Mount Desert Island. We can spot three of the largest western mountains from left to right. Bernard Mountain, Mansell Mountain, and Beach Mountain. To the west are the pure waters and remote islands of Blue Hill Bay. Back on shore is the pencil-thin glacial lake Seal Cove Pond. The trip is nearing an end. We can see the waters of Western Bay and the Mount Desert Narrows, which separate the island from the mainland. The Acadia experience weather by air, car, hiking, or by boat is transformative. It will turn you, at least temporarily, into a person of the Dawnland, a person who understands why Acadia National Park is the Eden of the East. <laughs>